I don't see anyone in the West who can beat them. I don't think the Lakers can beat them. I don't think the Jazz can beat them. I love the Suns. I don't think the Suns can beat them. All right, let's move on to the Brooklyn Nets more. Uh, you know, I think clearly three of their spots are accounted for. It Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, James Harden. I don't think, despite his miserable playoffs, I'm going to guess Joe Harris is also locked into that starting lineup as well. So that leaves the center position as their big question in the starting lineup. Um, when LaMarcus Aldridge, you know, he only played five games with them before his brief retirement. He is now back. And so he started all five games at center for them when he was with them. But Blake Griffin started all 10 games for them in the playoffs um, at center after Aldridge was gone. Or sorry, all 12 games. Uh, they also have Nick Claxton and then they bring in Paul Millsap this offseason as well. So they have a lot of options at center. Which way do you think they go? So I've already raised this concern a little bit. I'm not going to go deep into it, but I'm I'm still a little bit cautious about LaMarcus Aldridge. I I think whenever you have a potential heart issue, it's just, oh, you know, it's uncomfortable. I hope the best for him, obviously, and I hope that those concerns are in the past. And, And if they are, and if there is no concern whatsoever, I then I think purely from a basketball perspective, it makes sense to start him with that particular core of Harris, Harden, Kyrie, and KD, because he does give them an element of spacing, not necessarily as a high volume three point shooter, but being able to knock down that 18 footer does give you a certain amount of space as well. Like teams aren't going to say, oh, we'll only go out and guard you if you're shooting threes. No, like Marcus Aldridge is one of the best uh, mid-range shooters in the NBA or used to be one of the best mid-range shooters in the NBA, especially for the big positions. So guys will come out and guard him, opening up driving lanes for you know the, the primary trio. So offensively, it would be Aldridge. I think if you really want to accelerate the development of the young guys, Claxton needs to be the center. Mm-hmm. And also, in which case, if you want to go that route, maybe you pump up his trade value before the trade deadline. And that's when you pivot into some some more you know, win now talent. Because mm-hmm. while we look at Blake Griffin, LaMarcus Aldridge, and Paul Millsap as win now players, fact of the matter is, yeah, but they're also really old. Like it's yeah. it's to the point where they could break down before the playoffs as well. So I, I think using Claxton and seeing if he's ready and if he's not, then trying to flip him for someone like in their late twenties that would be a smart play. And if that doesn't work out, you can always pivot to Blake Griffin, who I think did solidly. And I don't don't expect a major drop off from him at all because he wasn't really reliant upon athleticism. Like he was just down and dirty and very effective. Yeah, I mean, he was shockingly, he he held his own shockingly well against Giannis in that second round series in particular. That looked like a big mismatch. And, you know, I think that is the, other than health, Overall, you know, the center spot is the biggest concern with this team because if they do run into Giannis or Joel Embiid during the Eastern Conference playoffs, they don't seem to have, despite all of their options, none of them seem that great. Right. You know, like Griffin did well last year, but as we just talked about in the last episode, like I expect a much better Giannis this year than we saw last year, which is terrifying to say. (laughs) Yeah. You know, MB, like that is just a 40 and 20 game waiting to happen from MB against any of these guys. Yeah. Um, I guess the good thing is they have so many different bodies to throw at all of these guys. Like MB and Giannis are among the most prolific free throw drawers in the league. But if you have Claxton, Aldridge, Griffin, James Johnson, Paul Millsap, that's 30 fouls to throw. You know, so even if one of these guys gets into foul trouble, it's not like, we're going to our second string center. We are just totally screwed already. Right. Um, but it's an oh, interesting one, point about Claxton. Thing, though, yeah. One thing. Were you also a little bit weirded out that Hassan Whiteside didn't sign with them? When you really think about just the role that he could have played there? Was that on the table? Like, did they express no, interest? Not, not, not from, you know, 
reliable sources, but I did I did see like someone race it, like oh. it, it, they, because that was their glaring hole. That was the center yeah. spot, and and you just brought up the analysis of Joel Embiid in particular. Mm -hmm. I, I know that Embiid feasts mm -hmm. on Hassan right. Whiteside, yeah, right, that, but yeah, in yeah. Just, just in terms of Ross' physical size, yeah. Whiteside was one of those players I kind of had eyed for for Brooklyn because that would just make sense in for a playoff perspective. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I understand why, because like he's clearly the backup in Utah versus he'd be going against, you know, through depending on when he signed and what else they did. Like they have five viable options to throw and hell six because they kind of throw Bruce Brown Jr. as their six oh, God, four yeah. center sometimes. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I was just I was kind of curious about that one because I thought yeah. that would at least give them some size. Like, don't get me wrong. I, I like Aldridge. I know Aldridge over the years bulked up. Like I think he's a legit 260 now, but he's not. How can I phrase? He's not very physical. Like he's not mm -hmm. one of those guys who'll come in and just like put the clamps on Joel Embiid, right? Right. And right, while right. Blake Griffin will try that, Griffin still just is no match for any beat. I wonder if they even had an option out there who's who would really affect Embiid, honestly. Probably not for a minimum deal, right? Outside of potentially Whiteside, right? Yeah, and even I mean, Embiid's yeah, had his way with Whiteside. Yeah, like yeah. Whiteside would foul out in about twelve minutes. Yeah, that's fair. All right, but but on your Claxton point, that's an interesting thing to bring up because he's a, this is his last year under contract. He's a restricted yeah. free agent next year, and they are just way 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 in the luxury tax already. You know, we've talked about 2025 providing some financial relief, but we're we're still a ways away from 2025. And if they sign James Harden and Kyrie Irving to extensions like they hope to, the, the, the tax is going to be a big issue for them for the next few years. So I don't know if they can afford to re-sign Nick Claxton. They might just have to rely on which old ring chasing big can we sign moving forward because we also you know they're going to have to deal with bruce brown jr will be an unrestricted free agent next i summer. think both so, of them are moved at the deadline because of that yeah and that's going to hurt them especially bruce brown jr but i well, mean it depends how, on what they get back yeah that's true but i mean both of those guys like bruce brown jr was very quietly critical to their switchability and then Claxton was just by far their most versatile big. Mm -hmm. So it's something to keep an eye on when we're talking about the Nets as like this overwhelming, unstoppable Thanos-like force. These are just, we're, we're bringing up potential holes that could arise throughout the year. Yeah. And also, I I, I just don't think this is the final roster by any stretch. I, I think yeah, right yeah. now this I, they have Seiko Dumboya on the, on the team as well. <laughs> Right. He just doesn't fit H wise at all, and with Javon Carter there, who's making three point six million as well, I could just see them doing a couple packages like where they, you know, maybe Bruce Brown is packaged with Dumboya, Javon Carter is packaged with Claxton, maybe those kind of deals where they go for maybe worse talent, but at least established talent that can come in and play vital roles in the playoffs. Yeah. So let's talk about Kyrie Irving because this just this report came out yesterday from your Roman Weitzman. So there is local vaccination requirements in New York and San Francisco prohibit players from playing or practicing in their home arenas without providing proof of at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccination unless they have an approved medical or religious exemption. Kyrie Irving has yet to receive a vaccine shot, according to multiple league sources. This is a from your own. Um, the Nets and the spokesman for Irving declined to comment on the record about Irving's vaccine status, but Nets general manager Sean Marks was asked during a news conference whether it could sideline any of his players. He said, quote, regarding if they could play today, I can't comment on who could play and so forth. There would obviously be a couple people missing from that picture. I won't get into who it is, but we feel confident in the following several days before camp, everybody would be allowed to participate and so forth. So it, it sounds like they might just be able to convince Kyrie to get vaccinated and this won't be an issue. But what if they can't? 
like how how concerned should they be about this? Because there's a chance that he's just not allowed. Like if he doesn't get it and he doesn't get this exemption, yeah. he is not allowed to play in home games for them. It's a good question that only Kyrie has the answer to. I think it's, uh, you know, we've we've had this conversation before that we just don't understand why players are some players because let's also quickly mention that 90 percent of the nba is vaccinated yeah but it's the remaining 10 percent. like we just don't we can't you and i can't really understand why why they just don't get with the program and do something that is objectively good for, for the greater parts of humanity um also side note I really don't understand that there are religious exemptions. So so we're basically just saying that practicing your religion is more important than, than controlling a pandemic. Really? I guess so. Wow. That's yeah. well, All right. I mean, I, I know it's an issue. You know, my wife's a doctor, so she deals with for Jehovah's Witnesses in particular uh, can be difficult. Oh, with, with, yeah. Like, with blood transfusions. Yeah. 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 So I, I don't know if that's the specific exemption right. that they had in mind but i i know that does come up a lot in the medical profession yeah well all right that, that's a part that i'll never understand but that's just me um yeah. but but in just in terms of of Kyrie, it, it really boils down to whether he's i guess willing to acknowledge that all right this is not gonna work well for my team i'm, I'm go- mm-hmm. we're going to actually probably miss out on a potential championship ring because of this decision like Maybe he needs to have a, no pun intended after our conversation just now, but it comes to Jesus moment um, yeah. and and just realize that, yeah, I need to do this for the greater good of the team and also myself and my own health and others' health. That might be good, but it's Kyrie. Um, so, so I don't know. It's such a hard question to answer because he is a guy who really you know dances to his own tune. And on mm-hmm. some level that can be commendable, when, when it's something that doesn't hurt anyone, like it's fine. Like him burning sage, yeah, fine. Like go nuts. Like it, that doesn't hurt anyone. It's fine. But him refusing to get vaccinated, and also this goes for Andrew Wiggins as well. Like let's not see yes. out Kyrie yes. Irving. Um, it, it goes for those two, and it goes for the 10% that aren't vaccinated in the NBA. So I, I don't want to put the spotlight exclusively on Kyrie. I don't think that's fair. Right. But, but no, it's, it's super concerning if he sticks with this mindset yeah if you're the nets god i can't believe i'm saying this like if you're the nets and you have championship aspirations brian and and your starting point guard is like nope i I won't do this do you consider a trade right well i mean you know Stephen a brought up the other day an idea of a Kyrie for ben simmons trade and he said you and i have a standing agreement to never cite Stephen a smith as a source (laughs) i know but well he said kd would overrule it yeah. But if we go into the season, Kyrie continues to refuse to get vaccinated, will can't play in home games, and we get to, you know, the, mm-hmm. the trade deadline and still isn't vaccinated, still missing every home game, they look and say, like, we're going to have home games in the playoffs, Kyrie. Like, yeah. we're just going to be without you for – it's a fair question. It's, you know, again, John Marks kind of – indicated that this won't be an issue, which seems to suggest they're going to be able to get everyone vaccinated in the coming days, which knock on wood will be the case, because this is a very stupid storyline that I don't want to have to monitor this year. But as we've seen with Kyrie and Wiggins, who you brought up, you know, the San Francisco Chronicle reported that he's facing the same issue. And to be clear right now, this is only affecting teams in New York and San Francisco. Visiting players have an exemption from this policy. So Which doesn't it, make sense, by the way. I know. I know. Yeah. But I mean, that's that's the way the laws were written or the rules were written for these two cities. Because I know there is some confusion about that. But that's Right. But it's still dumb. So you're basically yes. saying that, oh, it's OK for visiting players to maybe have the Corona Rivers, but, but players in our own team. No, no, no. Like, we can't have that. Wait, what? Wait. Right. I, if you're if you're like if Andrew Wiggins remains unvaccinated, like he shouldn't be, and they don't allow him to play there, then they shouldn't allow him to play anywhere. Same with Kyrie. Yeah. Same well, with I mean, the ten percent of the players. 
What the hell? The, the laws do require like everyone else in the building. Fans have to show proof of vaccination to go into right. these large indoor. So like literally everyone else but yeah. the players will be vaccinated. And I wonder if the theory is, you know, I'm sure the people writing these laws when they made that exemption have been in touch with all the different sports leagues, know how draconian their policies are for unvaccinated players. So maybe they know, all right, if these people are unvaccinated, they're going through these daily PCR tests. Like they're going to catch these cases before they actually arise. So like in theory, they're not going to allow an unvaccinated Andrew Wiggins into the arena contagious with coronavirus because they would have caught it already before that and, and nothing is 100 percent. so i agree right. it's a, it is a dumb exemption and it just everyone should just get vaccinated so we don't have to talk about this anymore <laughs> right yeah like, like this has been a topic for two years now almost like late 2019 like let, let's just move on like let, let's yeah. get this you know bury this thing by aligning ourselves but one note though i will say if it becomes that big of a problem where the nets are like we have to trade Kyrie and KD is like, nope, not going to happen. Don't do this. I can point to KD's contract that he signed yeah. and go, well, here you go. I mean, you you just signed a, a long-term contract with us, so <laughs> well, that, you can't really do a whole lot. Then he's going to look at Ben Simmons and be like, I bet you I can. So, yeah, we shouldn't be talking about Ben Simmons quite yet, but yeah. But honestly, I, mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't hate if teams took a little bit more harsher approach to that. I can just call their bluff. Yeah. Well, let's let's assume Kyrie does get vaccinated by the playoffs, yes. which would be great. And that's what we're all rooting for. Just yes. Everything's short. <laughs> yes. Yes. If all three of those guys, KD, Kyrie, James yeah. Harden are healthy going into the playoffs and stay healthy throughout the playoffs, because yes. as we saw, that was what did them in last year. Can anyone realistically beat this team in a seven game series? Yeah, I think they can, but it's going to be exceedingly difficult. I mean, Milwaukee to me is really the only team out there that I I think I would give a proper chance at it and a proper crack at it. And yeah. honestly, I because we kind of talked about this on the previous podcast. I think just because they won the championship last season I think they come in with a new sense of confidence. I think they come in with with very little fear, and maybe that actually plays to their advantage. So I'm I'm not ruling out the box whatsoever in in a in a playoff series. I think it could it can go both ways, but that's the one team that I think could really beat them. Um, yeah. Like if if they go up against like Philly, Miami, Boston, Chicago, New York, like no, no, not really. I don't. I can't see a scenario where in you know, those three guys don't step up each and every game, at least two of them. So the point, like, what can you what can you really do? I mean, Harden yeah. to me is really the key to all of this because he's not just one of the league's best scorers. He's also one of the league's best facilitators. So mm-hmm. he can wear these multiple hats. Like if Kyrie has an off game, it's primarily going to be shooting driven. It's not going to be yeah. him not being able to facilitate or whatnot because he's not a natural facilitator. If his game is off, it's because he's not hitting. And then Harden can carry that burden. He can say, oh, okay, you know what? It's fine. Kyrie, you just dribbled the ball off the court instead of me because that means that I get a little bit less fatigued and then I can jack up 25 shots. It's <laughs> right. fine. Right. So, so there is that whole thing of that trio being able to, to kind of cover for each other, especially offensively. Yeah. Defensively, I do have some concerns, but it's not to the point where I'm worried because, again, the league is so heavily influenced by shot creation as opposed to defense. Mm-hmm. So I, I just don't think there's a team out there that can defend the Nets as well as they can score. So it doesn't even right, matter right. if the Nets have a bad defense. Yeah, and their defense wasn't as bad as advertised in the playoffs. Yeah, right, it wasn't. It was like, yeah, it was not super elite. But it was fine. It, it yeah. was passable. And that, as you said, when you have three of the top, I mean, this is the theory, right? Like all three of those guys are among the top individual shot creators in the league. Right. And when you need a tough bucket in the fourth quarter of a close playoff game, you just need guys who can create their own shot at a high level. They have three of the best in the world. So yes. like 
if we if they do get into those situations, you feel better about their chances than you know if Drew Holiday has to create his own shot, or if Bam Adebayo has to create his own shot, or Tobias Harris has to like I, I'm taking Kevin Durant or Kyrie Irving or James Harden over all of those guys. Um, so yeah, I agree with you. Milwaukee is the biggest threat. I I don't see anyone in the West who can beat them. I don't think the Lakers can beat them. I don't think the Jazz can beat them. I love the Suns. I don't think the Suns can beat them. Clippers, we just don't know with Kawhi being hurt. Like a fully healthy Kawhi, maybe. Yeah, yeah. That would be the only. That would be the only thing. Like a fully healthy Clippers team. That's where I could see it. But yeah, yeah. But Miami is the other. I, we mentioned them in the Southeast preview. They are the dark horse. I think. They are the, the one other team that I think could really put a scare into Brooklyn just because, you know, Lowry, Butler, Adebayo do match up pretty well defensively against those other guys. You could put, you know, Lowry on Kyrie, Butler on Harden, Adebayo on Durant. That's the biggest mismatch of the three. But like the depth, I think, is where Brooklyn would end up beating Miami because we, we uh. talked. I, I disagree with that pretty pretty heavily. I, you don't think I, they have a chance? No, I don't. So so here's the thing. This is where I think defense is being overstated. Yeah. I love Kyle Lowry's defense. Don't get me wrong. Kyrie has arguably the craziest handles in the history of the league. Yeah. He he like there's just no answer to when he gets in his back. It, there really mm-hmm. isn't. Even if you are Kyle Kyle Lowry. Like Kyrie can create something out of literally nothing. So yeah. that individual skill level is just so much higher than what Kyle can respond to. And then for the at a bio KD thing, like no. I, I get it yeah. if it's a half court setting, but no. KD well, they have on the fast too. Court, No, they have still still to throw no. KD. I know. Still no. I mean it's KD is again, he's a seven footer who can who can hit from twenty eight feet off the dripple. Yeah. Like no, it's just bam, you can't even if you're bam, like let's like, just take your scenario in place here. Like if you're bam, you have to pick him up 30 feet from the basket. If you do that, KD with those long strides are gonna go right by him. It, yeah. So I well, I maybe I you start you, you could start Tucker on him and then be able to switch if he blows by Tucker out of bios right there to meet him. But Tucker is slow footed as well. Like he's not yeah. but the only thing, the only one I could see having a, an advantage here is Jimmy because right. Jimmy defends James Harden better than anyone in the league. He is so good at it. That's the, that's the one thing. But again, that's where my previous point comes to play because then if James is having a rough night shooting because of Jimmy, well, Jimmy can't take away his passing. So right. then James is going to be like, oh, okay, this is not going to be a night where I score 30, but this is going to be a night where I get 15 assists. Hey, Kyrie, move in a semicircle and yeah, KD, just stand around because you can shoot, shoot over everyone. <laughs> yeah. like, it's yeah. fine. So I, I don't believe Miami is the team that could stop them. I think it's, I, honestly, I think it's Milwaukee and no one else. Like, I agree with you on the Western Conference run. I Side note, I've seen a lot of Lakers fans over the past couple of weeks say that they present the best weapon to the Brooklyn Brooklyn Nets. And I'm like, what? I don't that see that. It's like, that's what I, they're. I don't see that. Well, so, so my apologies, Lakers fans, but you guys aren't really the best at going into the minutia of things. Like they sure. just, this is like the depth purposes. Like I think someone brought up like Melo off the bench as a scoring component where I'm just like, are you? kidding me like look at, look at what they have right here and you're bringing up a, a bench scoring component I, I don't i don't agree with that i just wanted to get no. that on the record i think we need to temper expectations with the lakers especially if they make it to the finals against the nets like, yeah i i don't see a single valid scenario wherein they could run with these guys at all no yeah i i don't either 